The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. On this week's Court TV podcast, we're off to Missouri where Lynn Lee Rennick is accused of murdering her husband, Ben Rennick, a renowned snake expert with a booming business. Court TV's Ted Rollins has been tracking the story from the beginning and will join me with an update on the trial. Then we'll preview the death of Dante Wright manslaughter trial, where a former police officer is facing manslaughter charges for mistaking her gun for a taser. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinny Politan. Welcome to the Court TV Podcast. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for listening and downloading. And uh, this is some amazing trial that is taking place in Missouri. It's it's moving amazingly fast. If you took this same trial and put it in, I don't know, California, it might be a four week trial, but it's only going to take days. And, I, and I'm absolutely shocked because there are, there is so much to this case. It's the snake breeder murder trial it involves a, a, a guy, he's kind of a young guy, uh, Ben Rennick, who is um, this nationally or internationally known snake breeder. I mean, incredible business, built it himself. And he ends up shot and killed in the middle of his snake farm. And the defendant is his wife, Lynn Lee Rennick. And the motivation here and the reason for all this, I mean, there's a lot of layers to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, complicated story because Lynn Lee Rennick is a complicated person. Uh, from my perspective, I don't quite understand her and her motivation for the things that she does and the things she's accused of doing. But she clearly had her in-laws fooled, fooled uh, from the beginning. They had no idea all the things that she was up to and what she was wrapped into. And and now it all is culminating in this murder trial. Let me bring in Court TV anchor Ted Rollins, who produced an amazing documentary on this case and, of course, uh, is covering the trial for us on Court TV every morning on your front row seat to justice at 9 a.m. Eastern. Ted, great to see you. Good to be here, Vinny. You know, Ted, uh, my show is, is the last show on Court TV, at, you know, at night, and yours is the first in the morning. And I was speaking with the producers the other night. We have a great idea for a segment at the end of my show, the last segment. What we'll do is we'll just call Ted, <laughs> wake him up around 11 o'clock at night and find out what's coming up in the, in the morning. How, how would that well, work, Ted? As long as you don't mind airing my voicemail, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> All right, let's get to the Lynn Lee Rennick. Describe who she is, because I, I can't get a, I don't understand why. All the, the things that she gets involved with, does she just, well, why don't you explain a little bit about Lynn Lee Rennick and, and some of the things that she's been involved with and, and perhaps some of the men and babies she's had, et cetera. Her defense attorney described her in front of the jury as a very social person. And uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, <laughs> That's no what the kids are calling it today. Yeah. Nobody contested that uh, label. Social indeed. It's hard to understand where her head was, except when you look at the, um, and this is very common in a lot of cases that we cover, people get themselves in a bind that at some point they realize they can't get out. And I think that's what happened to her with two things, financial, she had a spa business that her husband, Ben, had helped her open, and she was bleeding money, taking money, and, and basically being deceitful, according to the state, around with the money issues, and she was having affairs. So she's cheating on her husband. She's taking money from the family and she uh, realizes that it's going to come to a head. It, uh, he is aware of it. There's some email text exchanges. He's coming down on her saying, hey, we're shutting this business down because we're bleeding out. We've got I'll give you an, another three months. She knows that it is only a matter of time before not only does she lose the spa, she's going to lose her husband and she's going to lose her way of life. That's what the state of Missouri is alleging. On the flip side, the defense says, no, no, no. She was just wanting, a, she's just trying to get a divorce from Ben because he, uh, he was mean to her, inappropriate to her. And they had some allegations of sexual abuse thrown out at trial here. But boy, this is, to your point earlier, a, a complicated young woman at age 39 or 29. 
Well, here, here's the thing, right? She's running this spa and she's having financial difficulties. And I, and I think it's, it's kind of related to the way she ran the spa. It seemed like she used it as a place to have extramarital affairs and, and had her, her, her priorities a little disrupted there in terms of what a spa is for. And it seems like for her, having a spa was, well, this is a place where I can sleep with other men while I'm married. And her spa was in Columbia, Missouri, and she fancied herself as more of a city slicker in Missouri, where they, the snake farm where she was living with Ben was out in New Florence, which is rural as rural can get. So I think if you want to really dissect it, and, and his, the, her defense team has said this publicly, there were, they were two different people. And Ben was very happy to be out in the middle of nowhere uh he was an introvert she on the other hand needed more and there i think if you want to see the genesis of the fall of this relationship might have been that well let's take a listen to one of the witnesses who testified for the prosecution who was someone who knew the defendant i I think was friends with her worked for her at the spa um and and She's an interesting part of this case. Let's let's listen to what she said first. She said that he had um, resources to take her kids away, and she didn't have the resources to divorce him, um, and she was afraid to lose her children. And when she talked about resources, did she say specifically what? Besides the children, those aren't resources, but what? Um, That he had money and established business um, that would help him, um, I guess, with an attorney to take her kids. I'm not... And uh, so she discussed divorce, but she had told you that that wasn't an option for her. Right. As a result of those conversations, did she present to you or talk to you about a, a different manner of handling or resolving her marital issues? Yes. What was that that she discussed with you? Um, she said that she didn't really think of any other option and that she asked if um, I could help her with murdering him. Okay, that's Ashley Shaw. And... She got a deal or she got immunity, right, Ted? So she can't be prosecuted. But she was part of the uh, first plot to kill Ben Rennick, according to her own testimony. Um, I, I, I don't understand how this happens, Ted. How do you all of a sudden go with, oh, my friend, my boss uh, is, is having problems in her marriage. And, oh, well, I guess I'll help her murder him. Yeah, this well, Ashley Shaw was an interesting um player in this and her testimony was absolutely chilling because of the nonchalant way that she delivered these horrible facts can you imagine being at work someday and and someone says hey i don't really see much around it i gotta i gotta whack my spouse do you mind helping me and then she says okay i'll uh i'll help and (laughs) it was not in the way she describes it. Yeah, I got some Percocets for my husband and we, we ground him up, put him in a shake. We were hoping it would kill him. Uh, unbelievable. And this was the world that, and I don't know if Lynn Lee was part of some group of strange individuals or if she was the center of it. It's hard to determine. Prosecutors will argue that she was the driver. The defense argues the opposite, that she was a pleaser involved with some um, shady people. And it, it is, to your point earlier, a convoluted case where the, there were two attempts, one was successful, the other not, to take Ben Rennick's life, the motive money for Lynn Lee, but she had help with both attempts. First, Ashley Shaw, and then an ex-boyfriend, Michael Humphreys, helps her actually kill him, according to the state. So here's the thing, right? If, if, you're, if you want to play the role that she's a pleaser, um, at the end of the day, the only one who could have potentially benefited from the murder of Ben Rennick was Lynn Lee Rennick. There was no one out there was there was no benefit for for Ashley Shaw that oh my boss's husband is now dead oh I'm I'm in Schaefer City now come on no just not just not just not there's no reason well, but yes you're right <laughs> and, and the defense tried to argue with a straight face by the way that. Ashley Shaw would have job security if Ben were dead because then Ben couldn't get rid of Lynn Lee and then she could keep the spa because she'd have a million dollars in life insurance and keep the spa open. So Ashley could continue to have a job as a office manager at a spa in Columbia, Missouri. It boggles the mind that there was some sort of motivation. But on the other hand, why did she do it? Why did she help 
this individual tried to kill her her husband. Uh, it just is a head scratcher. It it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense. But it, it, there's something to it. There's absolutely something to it because Ben Rennick is dead, and Ashley Shaw is admitting all this. And and usually, you know, someone who gets immunity, you can attack their credibility because well, you got immunity. But her immunity is for something that implicates the defendant. So I don't know how you can really argue that. You know, it's not like she got in trouble for something else and is then giving up this information. The only thing that she is in trouble for, in my understanding, is this actual attempted murder that she was involved in. Which is pretty significant, but it is framed this way by... The, but, she's not, but there's no incentive for her to make up this story to get out of something else, is my point. The defense, yes, and the defense is framing it this way. They're saying that they... They got a hold of Ashley Shaw and they said, listen, if you can tell us something that would implicate Lynn Lee, then we'll help you out and you will never be charged with anything. And the implication from the defense is that she made up this shake poisoning and the gun procurement story um, just so that whatever she did do, um, she would not be exposed to and that it's all just lies. It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. The bottom line is she came across as very um, chilling, but credible when she took the stand in front of the jury. She was just spitting out fact after fact. And I don't know how you combat it. And it moved very quickly. Let's take a listen to a little bit of her cross-examination. Prosecutor um, is willing, if you are 100% honest, and give information in this homicide that helps us solve it. Basically, he's willing to work with you. What else does he say? Otherwise, you would be accessory to first-degree murder, and first-degree accessory two is the exact same charge as first-degree murder. Keep Go going. Um, we're here because we have information that you helped plan, and you actually took part in an attempt on Ben's life before Ben was actually killed. So I just want to put that out there and go back and let you be 100% honest. Keep going. On what happened, because we know a lot of what happened. Keep going. There are arrests are going to be made today. People are going to be in jail for first degree murder. We've got the warrants typed up and ready to be sent out. So basically now is the time. You're either, continue? Can we continue? Yes. Uh, you're either on Team Lindley or you're on Team of team Missouri and Lindley's team is going to jail. All right. Well, now we know how investigators got her to talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not on Team Lindley. That's for sure. And, and but the defense is using that to their advantage, saying they cornered her into this. They didn't have those, you know, warrants typed up. They they were lying and, and they used that fear to get her to lie. The the problem is what you mentioned earlier. How did she come up with the Percocet? I, you know, this whole story and fill in all the blanks. I mean, everything that she brought to this investigation in terms of the information fits it fits perfectly in terms of what lindley did the actions you know the, the fact that she left her phone at the spa and, uh, when she went to kill her husband ben all of it fits perfectly and that's the problem that the defense has what ashley shaw says at it fits th their pieces of the puzzle absolutely and and again for me the big part of her credibility is why is she doing this? And and what, what what is her benefit? Like the benefit is she doesn't get implicated in the murder or the attempted murder, which is huge, but that directly is connected to this defendant. There's no other trouble that she's in that she's, she's got to make up a story to get out of that. Like, Oh, she, she, you know, she uh, got involved in, in a, in a robbery somewhere else. And they said, okay, that robbery will go away if you cooperate in this and we'll give you immunity. No, that's not, that's not the way it went down. Now, the second uh, big witness for uh, prosecutors in this case is a co-defendant, Michael Humphrey. And give us the background on the relationship between Michael Humphrey and Lynn Lee Rennick. And I know at some point they probably slept together. Well, you happen to be right on that one, Benny. Uh, they did. They had a uh, romantic relationship, we'll call it. And um, they weren't together for several years i think it was seven years they had been apart but michael humphreys was a guy that lindley knew from her past that had access to either a hitman according to ashley shaw or at least a weapon so she ashley shaw says that lindley and her after poisoning ben didn't work 
They went to plan B. And according to Ashley Shaw, Lynn Lee wanted someone with a gun. Ashley didn't have one. So she said, you know what? I got an old boy from Michael Humphrey. They go visit him and they tell, according to Ashley Shaw, Michael Humphrey, that Lynn Lee's husband is physically abusing her. He is an abuser. So Humphrey steps up with aspirations to maybe rekindle it with old Lynn Lee and plays this part and gets access to, he has a gun. They go out and they shoot and kill Ben Rennick at his snake farm. Humphrey says she did it. Now, Lynn Lee is claiming Michael Humphreys was just there for protection when she went to ask for a divorce. And he ends up, unbeknownst to her, killing her husband, Ben. Yeah, I, this guy I trust a lot less, a lot less. Um, this is a guy who's, who's had other trouble with the law. This is a guy who's actually there. And this this becomes a problem. If, if Ashley Shaw didn't exist... This would be a difficult case for prosecutors. It would be a very, very, a much more difficult case. No case is easy. No case is guaranteed. But the combination of the two, I think, really helps prosecutors immensely. But let's take a listen to a little bit of Michael Humphrey describing the, the shooting. Um, so like I said, I was looking at a whole lot of snakes. Um, and then I heard a shot come out, um, which... Inside there was extremely loud, so I kind of ducked a little bit. I looked down through there, and she was at the end of the um, corridor, whatever you want to call it, posed up like this with a gun. Uh, and so you hear one shot and react to that. Yeah. And then look down to where they're at. Right. And when you look down there, how is Ben positioned if you if you can see him? I, I couldn't see him at that point. Where he was at? Yeah, I, I actually couldn't see him. So he, he at least wasn't standing upright. Right. Okay. You could see her though. Right. And you said she was. She was. If you could stand up and show how she was positioned. Something. Something. It's kind of like this. Okay. And, th and then did you say you heard more shots? Um. As I turned and went out the door, um, I thought two to three more, and then another one or two after I was outside. You weren't counting though, were you? I was not. But you heard, would it be fair to say, you heard several more after that initial shot? Right. But you, you turned and ran out the door. Correct. So he's there, but he says he's not really, like, exactly there when all this is happening. So what what's his story as to the the purpose of that trip? I mean, did, did they go there? Did he understand, was his understanding that we're going to murder this guy or we're going to kill this guy, whether it's for, because he's an abuser or any other reason, but that's the, the purpose of the trip. And that's why he got the gun. Yes. In that he, um, he says he went there thinking that um, he, they, they were going to possibly kill Ben Reddick, but the bottom line is he didn't want to do it. And he says that Lindley took control and said, I am going to kill him. And the plan was for her to do it. Now on the witness stand, it kind of makes, you know, he, everybody does this, right? They, they get on the stand and they try to, for whatever reason, it's ridiculous. The guy's spending the rest of his life in prison, but he wants to sugarcoat it and somehow make it, make himself look not as bad. So his version of events is like almost this, oh, let us start hearing gunshots. And I wonder what happened. And there's Lynn Lee standing with the gun. I mean, Come on, give me a break. So to your point earlier, he's not a great witness, but combined with Ashley Shaw, he makes sense. He makes sense that they had, they found, they went to the depths of Lynn Lee's past and pulled out Michael Humphreys to help them kill Ben. That part of the story actually makes sense. And he played the part perfectly when he walked in in his prison garb, um, describing his version of events, even if you don't believe the details. Now, the other part is he got a deal, right? He was he went to trial before Lynn Lee and was convicted by a jury of the murder and now has an opportunity to someday maybe be eligible for parole. Yeah, he's was looking at life without parole. He's convicted. <laughs> this is, you know, a very strange situation, but now they make a deal. The prosecution says, hey, listen, dude. Uh, you know, we're going to be sentencing you next month. If you if you cooperate, we'll recommend you go down for second instead of first, meaning there's a window for parole down the road. And he said, yeah, sure. And not only does he agree to testify, 
he finds and shows them and gives them the murder weapon. A uh, huge advantage now for the, it gives him credibility. The guy's got the murder weapon and his, he's with Lynn Lee. He had, you have Ashley Shaw making the connection. The state's case is very strong here. Let's take a listen to a little bit of the cross-examination of, again, key witness for prosecutors. You were convicted of a felony, right? Prior to this incident. The, the one I was talking about earlier in 2012. Yes, well, whichever one. You, you're you a felon. You were a felon in 2017. I had one drug charge, yes. It, it, was That's it a felony? Right. Yes. That makes you a felon. And that Correct. Doesn't it, okay? Absolutely. And you can't have a gun when you're a felon, right? You're not supposed to possess a gun. That's correct. Okay. You're not supposed to. That that would be a yes, wouldn't it? I had purchased a gun before I was a felon. It's illegal for you to have a gun when you're a felon. Correct. But you had a gun anyway. Right. And you brought a gun to the spa that day. Correct. And you brought a gun to the spa that day. You claim at the same time that you claim you were under the impression you were she was just going there to talk to Ben. That's that's not the same day. I, again, he hedges on everything. Classic uh, convicted criminal defendant. Well, it's illegal for me to possess, but yeah, I, I bought the gun before I was convicted. So, you, you know, there's a little bit of, I was grandfathered in, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to have the, unbelievable. You know, what's funny about this guy, Ted, and I thought he was, you know, I saw the mug shot and then I saw him on the witness stand and he, and he actually looks a lot better on the witness stand than he did in his mug shot that we had been showing on the air for a while. Actually, sort of a striking guy. I think he could have been a male model if he wasn't a convicted felon and murderer. Well, he could have been. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I was watching the testimony as well and had uh, just, a, you know, I felt bad because you do you look at the young man. He is still a young man. Um, and because of his lifestyle choices with the with drugs, he admitted using a lot of meth and, um, and, and, and all the rest of it. It's just, it's sad because you do see the human being in there. Um, and we saw it on the stand it's a lot different than the mugshot just after a month of cleanup. It, it's sad is the bottom line. All of these choices that these people have made, um, you know, what could have been. Now the, the real lesson though, for someone like, Lindley Rennick, if in fact it's true, right, is that she's saying, well, I have no chance of divorce. He's got the money. He's going to get the kid. No, that's not the way our system works. I mean, you talk to family lawyers and there's a there's a built in um, advantage uh, that, that women have a slight advantage in terms of getting custody of their children. But the fact that you're cheating on your husband has no impact on custody. Zero zip, not a nothing that you were losing money in the spa. So you lost money in the spa. All of this was so unnecessary, unfounded, and, and makes me think I, either people are really don't understand how divorce works or there was some other reason, which would be the million dollars you get. You don't have to split it. You don't have to go to court and everything else. Because if you go to court, it'll be an equitable solution. You'll get custody, whether it's joint or sole custody of the kids, and you're entitled to the money. You're entitled to the money. Whatever money came into the marriage, you get you get your fair share of it. That's the way the system works. And by the way, if your husband has all the money, he's got to pay for your lawyer too. So this none of this makes any sense. And if it's the other way around, if the wife has all the money, she's got to pay for the husband's lawyer. That's the way our system works. But anyway, that's just me um, getting on a soapbox. Ted Rollins is going to stay with us when we come back. Um, as this trial is happening, we're getting ready for another big trial on Court TV. Uh, and we'll have a preview of a case that really began in the middle of the trial of Derek Chauvin, the man who murdered George Floyd. That's next. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. So on Court TV, it's gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of trials across the nation. And 
You know, the month of December historically is a slow month in our system of justice. Because of the holidays and everything else, it's difficult to get jurors. And most judges don't schedule trials in December and certainly stay away from the high profile cases in December. But that's not the the case this December. I mean, we've got several of them. Uh, One big one uh, that is, is getting underway is in Minnesota, the case of Kim Potter. She was an officer who in the middle of the Derek Chauvin trial was involved in a motor vehicle stop of a guy named Dante Wright, Uh, who had, there was a warrant out uh, for his arrest, but it was a motor vehicle stop. They're getting ready to arrest him. He resists arrest and then uh, somehow escapes from one of the officers who's trying to arrest him on the side of his car. He gets back into his car and there's a struggle. And then Kim Potter comes over, uh, joins in all of it, um, and then pulls out her service weapon and yells, taser, 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 and then fires the service weapon. And shoots and kills Dante Wright. And now she's on trial uh, for manslaughter in Minnesota. Ted Rowland's still with me. Uh, Ted, all of this happened in the middle of the Derek Chauvin case. Um, there, were, there were protests and, and people during the, the trial of Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd thought that perhaps what was happening after this shooting could impact that trial. Yeah, it was front page news in Minneapolis during this process, and it was an issue at the Trova trial. And more importantly, it for the citizens of the Twin Cities, it was a, oh my goodness, here we go again. What's going on with our law enforcement agencies? But, the, you know, when you peel back the layers of this case, it is uh, it is much different than um, what was alleged and what the jury found in, in uh, the Chauvin Floyd case. It just is. Yeah. And this it's, it's much different than Chauvin. And now as I look at this and I've watched the body cam footage many, many, many times, we've, we've broken it down on my show. It's about a minute long. And as I watch it to me, this was accidental. It was not done. This was not, if it was on purpose, it would be murder. I mean, she did not intend to fire her service weapon at Dante Wright. And I know some people are saying, yeah, she did it on purpose. This is murder, et cetera. She's not even charged with murder. So to me, that's out, it's out of play. So as I look at this case, it, it, it's much different. This is a case where our system of justice, criminal system of justice, has to figure out when is an accident a crime? Because I, I, I don't believe any argument after watching the video and the circumstances surrounding it. It's not on purpose. It's a manslaughter charge. Um, Ted, these are tough ones, I think, for, for jurors. Very. And, you know, as a side note, I, I am disgusted by people that know better. And I'm not going to say specifics, but um, as we cover this, things have come up. And there's this allegation. There's this stoking of a uh, theme that Kim Potter did this intentionally, that she somehow is, was pretending and, and um, pulled her service weapon on purpose. And to your point, no. That's not what happened. And anyone who watches that video knows that's not what happened. And the prosecution is not going to argue that in front of the jury. The prosecution is going to argue that some mistakes are just so egregious that you need to be punished. Yes, it was a mistake, but no, we're not going to uh, just allow you to continue to live your life the way you did before because of the gravity of that mistake. And that's the ultimate choice here. And it is a fascinating case. It's a heartbreaking case. Um, the Wright family had lost a 20 year old for nothing. Um, and, and Kim Potter made a horrible, horrible mistake, which, which has huge ramifications to a lot of people, including herself. And I think there's a, a couple of ways this may break down. Uh, I think one way prosecutors are going is they're going to argue that the taser should not even be drawn. So the fact that She's attempting to use a taser, even though she doesn't have a taser in her hand. She has her service weapon in her hand. That even the use of the taser at that point is not appropriate, is against policy. I've read that policy. Uh, I think it's absolutely in the gray area because as you watch the video, Dante Wright is in the midst of a struggle. Things are getting physical. He did not comply. He was under arrest and refused to allow the officer to uh, handcuff him and the officer did, I think, a bunch of things wrong there in, in keeping the door open while he's attempting to arrest him. That door should have been closed. 
Uh, he should have been moved away, perhaps, from the door, wherever they were, because things were calm for a moment before things uh, escalated very quickly. Yeah, and, and that is the decision. Was that an, uh, an unreasonable use of force in that circumstance, given her training? And this is where her training comes back to haunt her, and we're going to hear a lot of testimony from um, Kim Wright's past, or Kim Potter's past in terms of her training, and uh, it's going to be a tough decision for this jury First degree manslaughter, second degree manslaughter are on the table. Um, she's going to testify. And th that's going to be fascinating because the empathy factor could be there with some of these jurors when she gets up on the stand and tells them the truth. Most defendants that take the stand get up and lie. Maybe not a huge, you know, not, but she has the opportunity and she, I think she will. She will tell the truth and that will come across. I think it's a huge advantage um, for her in this situation because she's not covering anything up. It's just a, what do we do with you, Kim Potter? That's the question this jury has. Now, the other part of this is, and I've had this discussion on my show with, with criminal defense attorneys who don't want to defend Kim Potter. Um, and, and they talk about um, the fact that she's a police officer that there's like some greater duty that she has. And I said, no, isn't the legal, the legal standard is the same for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. And this came up in the context of me comparing this with the accidental shooting uh, by Alec Baldwin and all the people involved in what happened on that movie set. And they say, yeah, officers are trained. And they all said, um, that's criminal because she's an officer and she's trained and she, she shouldn't have made that mistake. Right. And then I said, yeah, but, and then they don't want anyone charged for the movie set shooting. But I said, but wait a minute, aren't these people engaged in their own profession as well? And isn't the armorer trained and doesn't the actor get some level of training for safety and everything else? I, 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 I don't see so much of a difference between the two as every criminal defense attorney on my show does who defends Alec Baldwin and everyone else on the movie set, but refuses to defend the police officer. Well, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting comparison. It's a little different and that, you know, Baldwin's not the armor. I, I would argue that the, the people handling the weapons on the set are more in tune to the Kim Potter than, than Baldwin because of just the circumstances. You don't want him being the last, um, decision maker on in that scenario but what do you do i mean at what point is a mistake so egregious that you're criminally responsible for your mistake um it's a question that society has to answer and um that's what is playing out and it makes this case fascinating yeah these are the these are tough cases for me as a former prosecutor um you know i looked at you know you talk about um motor vehicle cases, right? Where there's an accident and someone dies. But if you're drinking and driving, I have, to me, that's not accidental. Um, but if you're driving and you make a, a, a bad decision, I think we've all been behind the wheel and done something stupid at some point, right? But what if that, that mistake you made results in the death of another human being? Should you be held criminally responsible for that? You are. Yes, you are. If you um, make a mistake while driving and you kill someone and you made a mistake. Not if you, if, if, there, if this was no fault of your own, if you make a mistake, you are liable and criminally you could face charges. You could, but I'm, I'm always wondered about should, should like the liability is clear, right? And then we have civil courts to deal with, with liability, whether it's wrongful death or, or however you want to gauge all that. But when the, to me, the mens rea, right? And, and so many of our criminal statutes are based upon state of mind, right? You've got to prove that state of mind. What did they intend to do? And, and in these cases, they don't intend the result. Uh, in the case of Alec Baldwin, he intended, uh, or, or he's saying he didn't squeeze the trigger. That's another issue for another day. Um, but they, they intended to handle the weapon. She intended to use a taser, but was using a service weapon. So there was intent to, for her to squeeze the trigger. It was the, it was the wrong trigger that, that she ended up squeezing. But was her intent to do anything close to what resulted? So 
Um, again, I wouldn't want to be on the jury. I'd have a hard time with this case. I'd have a hard time with the Baldwin cases. All of them, to me, civil liability is 100% clear. End of road. Kim Potter should not be a police officer. I mean, it's a mistake you make that you you, you know you can't make that mistake. So we'll see, Ted. Um, your your thoughts about um, Kim Potter on trial versus Derek Chauvin? Do you think she at all gets gets tainted by the Floyd Chauvin effect in Hennepin County because they're in the same courthouse. I think it's the same courtroom as that trial. It is the same courtroom. And this was a theme during voir dire. Are you concerned as a potential juror about making the wrong choice and ramifications in our city? That was flushed out. One would have to hope during voir dire and that the, the panel that was selected won't have that outside influence either way. I don't think either side would want it um, to infiltrate the courtroom, but I don't know how you don't get around it because every one of those jurors lived through George Floyd's death in the aftermath of it, the show of a trial, and then heard about Kim Potter and Dante Wright. So it's there. You have to just believe in the system that they're going to put it aside and and um, just judge on the facts of the case. We shall see. We shall see. Gavel to gavel coverage. Ted Rollins, thanks so much. You can watch Ted every morning on Court TV. When we come back, folks, uh, I'm going to talk about race. I am going to do it. I'm going to do it. This is a dangerous segment coming up for me, right? Anytime you start talking about race, but it's a real issue in in cases and in trials, and it's talked about, bantered about. Uh, But how about race and the Kim Potter case? Because Dante Wright is, is black and Kim Potter is white. Does that matter? Should it impact anything inside that courtroom? I'll let you know when we return. Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. Okay, so Kim Potter is an officer, was an officer. She is white. Dante Wright was the motorist, the shooting victim. He's black. Okay? And there's no way around it. It is what it is. But the question is, does does race truly have anything to do with this trial? And I will look at it through my filter, which is as a former prosecutor. Okay, I'm not looking at it as a civil rights advocate because the the much different perspective and viewpoint. I'm not looking at it as a member of the African-American community. I'm not looking at it as a member of the uh, community in, in Hennepin County. I'm looking at it as a prosecutor and the way the case will be tried. And you begin with jury selection and, and you, you look at that and you say, OK, well, what kind of jury do I want as a prosecutor? You know? Do, do you know, am I afraid, am I afraid of an all white jury? Am I really scared of the skin color of the jury? Do I feel like that will impact my ability to convict someone of a crime that I believe they committed? And I will be honest with you. The answer is no. It's absolutely no in this one. It is no, this, this, this case for me as a prosecutor has no no racial component. It's not a hate crime. It's not even a crime of intent. And, and there's not even an argument that, oh, this person was pulled over because of the color of their skin. There was a warrant out for his arrest. It was a lawful stop. It was a lawful arrest. And Dante Wright resisted that arrest, but should not have died. Should not have died as a result of this. But for me as a prosecutor, is, is any of this any of this connected to people's skin color? And to me, the answer is no. I'm not going to get into that courtroom and argue, ladies and gentlemen, this was a this was a crime that was motivated by this 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 racial prejudice that is just permeates this defendant and this police force. No, that's 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 not what the case the case is about. The training that Kim Potter had, the years of experience that Kim Potter had, um, how exactly do you grab for your service weapon versus your taser, 
What is the difference between your service weapon and your taser? There's a difference in the weight, the grip, the feel, the color, which side of the belt it is on, when they are used and what they are used for. That's what this case is about. And actually, for prosecutors to be successful here, this is not an easy case, for prosecutors to be successful, they really have to focus on use of force and whether or not a taser was even appropriate. That's the, that's the issue. If they win on that issue, that's how they win this case. If they convince this jury beyond a reasonable doubt that a, a taser should not have even been drawn, that's how you win. That's how you win. If, in fact, the jury believes that it was lawful for her to draw a taser in, that, in those circumstances, you've, you've got another obstacle now. You've got another huge obstacle. But none of this, none of this, from the prosecutor's perspective, should have anything to do with the race of the defendant or the race of the victim in the case. And again, that's the way I'm looking. I'm not looking at this in terms of curing society or anything else. I'm talking about trying a case, believing that a crime has been committed and trying to hold someone responsible and, and get to the truth of what happened here. And, and the truth is a, a mistake was made. But now as a prosecutor, I've got to prove this mistake was so egregious either by using force that wasn't necessary or attempting to use force that wasn't necessary, the taser, or going against all the training and 20 years of experience that Kim Potter has. To, to go against all of that, that's the only way. Again, this is, not, this is not a slam dunk. This is not easy. We know that she is responsible. We know that it was wrong. We all agree and know she should not be on the police force. Now the question is, is she a criminal? And the way to find out is to watch the trial on court TV. And it's one of these rare mid to late December trials that we don't get on your front row seat to justice, but we have it. And you will see and hear all the evidence, but you've got to get court TV to do it. And court TV available so many different ways. First of all, if you have a digital antenna, you can watch us there, rescan it, find Court TV. Um, there are streaming services everywhere that we're on, Roku. You can go to CourtTV.com, find out exactly where to find it um, in your zip code. So I've done my part here. The, the, now the rest is up to you to find the case and, and, and to uh, watch it. You can also check out our show notes. We'll have links to um, important information on this case and others uh, and all the podcasts that we do here. That's it for now. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great week. And as always, don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.